In the Wild West world of podcasting, there is one podcast that is authentic and genuine and continues to stand tall in its originality. Based on a passion for his guests, their work, and his love of podcasting, Derek Thomas and Monday Morning Critic Podcast get amazing, diverse, unique guests found nowhere else. They include Hall of Fame athletes, Academy Award winners, Golden Globe winners, Super Bowl champions, Emmy winners, award-winning authors, award-winning film score composers, directors, trailblazers, pioneers, and venters. The variety and quality are endless. There is something for everyone. Derek Thomas is the hero you deserve. He's a silent guard. Guardian, a watchful protector. Welcome to Monday Morning Critic Podcast. Here is Derek Thomas. Hange. And Rambis, and it's a five on two for the Lakers. And Worthy is decked, and Worthy doesn't like it. And Greg Kite was tagged. Both coaches have come on to try to pull things down. And, Tommy, that was a very rough takedown of James Worthy. Yes, it was. I believe it was Greg Kite who uh, would be physical on a play. But one of the things that people feel about James Worthy is that if you hit him hard on the layups, he stops going strong to the, the basket. It's an intimidation thing. But here you're going to see... Kite just come at him and really take him down. That was a hard foul. Now, Worthy was going to get it. He should have not come up and started swinging. Yeah. And Kite comes back at him. What's going to happen now is in the lap of the guards as far as Worthy and Kite are concerned. How would you compare that to the Lane Beer Bird incident in Detroit? Different situation, I think. Each play is different. An old-time Boston-L.A. rivalry. A lot of people think something was missing. Well, watch this. Dennis Johnson fouled James Worthy and... Johnson and Kite, it looked like both put down Worthy, and Worthy, who had not had a productive first period, then started going after Kite. A double technical foul was called on Worthy and Kite, no shots taken, and a personal foul was charged to Dennis Johnson. Look at Pat Riley getting right in the middle, and what else is new? This is another angle of the same play, and this is Worthy going in. Dennis Johnson commits the foul, and Kite, both of them with a hard takedown which has been part of a lot of what we've seen in the playoffs. my next guest is a 12-year nba veteran and he's been part of two championship teams with our beloved boston celtics welcome greg kite greg thanks for coming on the podcast today hey glad to be here Derek. good to, good to, nice to join you greg so um you know I, I, i'm reading about this 10 year old kid that went to a basketball camp with rudy tom Janovich and, and, and elvin hayes what was that like i mean i have to imagine you know i, I you must have been just delighted to not only just be with these two legends, but to learn the game. And even at such a young age, right? Well, you're doing some deep research there to find that, <laughs> that, that, that info. But uh, yeah, I grew up in Houston, Texas. So um, when, um, when I was a kid, five, six, seven years old, I had, I had older, two older sisters and an older brother. My brother and my dad and I would go to uh, some of the University of Houston ball games when the Elvin was playing there so he was kind of a you know local hero and uh and then when the rockets came to town i was they they I think they moved from san diego they they had been i don't know that was about 1970 or something and uh so my interest in basketball had grown then i got to play on my first team uh, on, a, on a ymca team when i was 10 years old before i went to uh uh what they called junior high back then middle school mm. but, but there were a couple of uh different camps that summer and one of them was actually at a uh st thomas high school in town and rudy was there as uh and rudy and uh, another rocket cliff mealy and i got to meet them and talk to them and they and then uh the other the other one was elvin it was actually a, an overnight camp in uh in uh college station texas near texas a&m and uh, it was pretty cool because elvin would elvin and the other uh co who was there with him uh, dick gibbs who played for the bullets uh, they, they bring a group of uh, campers up to you know, in the evening up to the room for a little while and just talk to them and have some some milk and cookies or whatever <laughs> tree was and it was, it was uh, so it was cool being around those those camps are good experiences for a young player and, they, and it can't be for any any young player in the game but also to be around those uh, those guys who were kind of uh, you know people guys we looked up to with the Rockets 
Yeah. Even though she used to. <laughs> yeah, Pershing Pershing Junior High School, uh James Madison High School. So you know, James Madison High School, you guys had a legendary team. We're gonna get to that in a second. Uh Greg, do you feel like um so you talk about camps, you know, we look at like we fast forward to twenty twenty one, there's they have camps, they have things like AAU. But I almost feel like, Greg, and I don't want to get too far off topic, but I almost feel like the intentions are different, right? So you're explaining your experiences, you know, sitting and talking. I feel like it's not the same today. While I think people do learn at camps, um, I, I do think some kids who play sports today, who play basketball today, uh, especially the parents, don't really have an idea, a lot of them, like what it really takes in the odds of those kids getting a scholarship and going to the next level. It's The odds are astronomical, but I almost feel like, People are in pursuit of these, I don't want to say, I don't know. I, I just feel like they don't have an idea of how difficult it is. And I feel like times have changed a little bit, Craig. Oh, they, have, they, they definitely have as far as the, uh, the system and youth sports. It's become a mega, mega industry, and it's, and it's kind of flipped on its head a little bit as far as uh, the, uh, the high school coaches – and teams that used to kind of be the, 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 what everything focused around. And now it's, now it's, a, it's often the opposite. The high school's season's important, but there, it's all this, uh, you know, AU is kind of generic term for it now, but it's, it's all this club, club basketball, travel team basketball that plays in not only you know, tournaments sponsored by AU, AU, but all the shoe companies, Nike, uh, Under Armour, Adidas all have their, circuits and many other people put on these tournaments so it's um it's basketball basketball but it's it's got some positives about it but it's got some uh real negatives you mentioned the one thing there because some of the unreal expectations of some of the uh parents you know what this is going to lead to i see these fifth graders going from florida to tournaments and, and this is not just one tournament for this is like six or seven or eight of them in the summer they're going to kansas city and houston and memphis and north carolina and atlanta two or three times they're going like you know <laughs> save that money <laughs> <laughs> in fact we're, we're this is this is a great i thought this was a great line we uh we're actually here in town visiting with us to stay with us this week is young lady who was all-american soccer player at byu and she got drafted by the orlando pride with the nwsl wow yeah and uh but because of the COVID situation, she's actually, you know, they played that college soccer season here in the spring and she's going back for, uh, to play the fall season. They'll come back and join them next year. But she said, we were talking about this system, even in soccer, volleyball, the other youth sports. She said, yeah, my mom made the comedy. She, she said, well, we got you a division one scholarship, but we, we more than paid for it with all the trips and travel that we did when, you, when she was playing in these youth systems, this youth ball. So, uh, it's definitely a, you know, definitely a big, big industry that, 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 uh, uh, you know, a lot of people buy into and there's some pluses about it, but there's some, there's also some negatives. Yeah. Yeah. That's well said, you know, and the sacrifices, as you mentioned, are, are unbelievable. Um, let me ask you a question. I'm going to bounce a little bit here before we get into your, your wonderful career here. Um, you're six foot 10 at the age of 15, Greg. Now, is that, I don't want to say difficult or paint this a uh, picture, but is that like, because you're you're a big guy. I mean, you, you you at the age of you know it's pretty much the same height from at the age of 15 to what you are now. Um, was that yeah. tough? That young, being that tall. I mean, I hate to ask such an elementary question, but um, is that like at that age, 15? I remember being 15. I was sensitive about everything. Well, is is am I reading too much into things? Is that a a fair question to ask you? No, it wasn't. It wasn't anything that I was really uh, embarrassed about or anything like that. Uh, but it, it was. Uh, you know, I, I used to joke. I was, you know, when I was growing up, I was always tall for my age. Now, now I'm tall for any age. But uh, <laughs> even in even in kindergarten, which I had a short kindergarten teacher, I was about as tall as my kindergarten teacher. So both my parents were six feet tall, and my dad, who was six feet, he grew to six feet by the time he was twelve. So I kind of took after my dad. I grew early, like I said. I did probably only grew about another inch after age fifteen. But I, you know, filled out and I had those years between like age ten and. 14 where i you know grew like a, a foot or whatever so it's just kind of different times for different people right you know for me especially going to the first year or so of junior high yeah it was awkward and and coordination was catching up with me but i had some you know one i was persistent and stubborn and wanted to work at and two i had some uh, great coaches who helped me with you know some tips on how to get better and learn how to jump rope and do agilities and get stronger and and you know i i, I tell the story in uh 
in, uh, in a lot of basketball clinics and camps over the years of, uh, and just motivational speaking. I, and I said, I had this dream and vision from being a 10 year old in those camps and, and, and uh, playing YMCA ball that I wanted to go on, one, be like my brother and play on the high school team, but two, then be a college player and three, be a pro player like a guy like Elvin Hayes or Reed Tomjanovich. And so this first year I go into junior high, middle school, I'm here, I'm growing a lot, I'm awkward. Um, I make the team, but if you wanted to see me play, you know, you probably had to come in warm-ups. You know, I scored, so I scored two points all season long. You know, I get in at the tail end of some blowouts, and, and uh, you know, it would have been real uh, easy to quit and give up. It's not quite the Michael Jordan story getting cut, you know, in 10th grade. But I think, uh, you know, a lot of young players and people can go through that. But it was that, you know, working through that growth spurt and just being persistent and working hard and staying with it that uh, got me over that. But uh, I look at the height, you know, as a – Advantage is a great gift. I, I I wish I'd maybe not stopped and grown another inch or two or got 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 arms are a little bit longer because it's uh, it's uh, definitely an advantage in basketball and and uh, so no no well was, that's yeah. that, that's well said yeah and you know let me ask you I read um I think it was in the NBA and if you didn't say this I'm going to be really embarrassed but I think you did where you because I struggle with this and, and I have a little not a little bit but I think persistently I have anxiety. Um, do, do, do you, I don't know if you struggle with that or that was something that came in the NBA, but I thought I read where somewhere where you, it, it was a little bit of an issue for you. Am I, is that correct, Greg? Yeah. Again, you've done some deep research. Cause I, 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 I remember maybe in one interview somewhere, uh, a few years ago mentioning that I hadn't really ever talked about a lot that, but yes, I did. Um, I did, uh, as in looking back at something that probably came up in my late teen years in high school, but I, and then carried with me through college and, and, and pro years and, you know, some, some issues off the court as well as on the court, but, uh, never really knew what it was. And in those days, you know, for sure, um, you know, you just thought, okay, you got a little nervousness, a little stage fright, you got, you got bad hands or what, whatever it is. And, uh, I think just kind of that setting of being in the uh, focus of attention, it's in some settings when you, you know, especially when you had a chance to think about it, mm. you know. It's kind of like, and, and, and that's bad, and that'd be really bad in golf. You know, you got lots of chances to think about the next shot, and, you know, basketball is a little more intuitive, but certainly some things like when you got the ball or when you're shooting. So um, and I didn't really realize uh, that that's what was going on a little bit until the, you know, until the very end of my career and got a little bit of uh, help and methods to maybe help that a little bit, but. You know, it's talked about more now. There's, you know, the anxieties, depressions, things like that, and and I'm sure now, now more than ever, you know, teams certainly at the college and pro level do some screening for that. But you know, back in my day, they they they, they really didn't. And and the thing for me, I think, you know, if you're a little anxious out there, you know, it's one thing when you're practicing or working out, but when you get in a game setting, you know, just naturally the the adrenaline and the other, um, you know. Uh, neuroreceptors get firing up really, really uh, to a high level and that can help you perform. But if it's, if it's too much, you know, if it's, it's too activated, that kind of is detrimental to performance. Yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, that's, that's the, that's the challenge in sports and the, you know, the mental side, the physical side, you get in that, you know, that, uh, the high intensity, uh, high adrenaline type, type, uh, you know, atmosphere, how do you, you know, slow yourself down, get in the moment and, and not, not, uh, you know, not to where you're, you're, you know, you're, you're thinking too fast or racing too fast or you're a little, you know, jittery or anxious. So, uh, definitely an important part of performance in sports and, and, uh, um, you know, yeah. be interested to see what they, you know, they do nowadays with, uh, young athletes to, to, to uh, Watch out for that. You were on a top five team in the nation. When you're, we mentioned your high school, James Madison High School. Uh, I want to say you were 39 and 0 coming into um, a game with uh, Lufkin High School. I look at, and I know some of the reading, on, doing the research, some of the people on your high school team. I mean, a lot of those, your teammates went off to phenomenal colleges. How, did Lufkin get lucky? Did they, I mean, because you guys were a powerhouse, like I said, top five team in the country. We, yeah, I mean, that, that's. You always look back at some of the losses more than anything. That's a loss that sticks with you. Yeah, we were ranked top top five in the country, number one in the state. Obviously, had that thirty nine game 
winning streak had done you know well the two previous years but didn't get to the uh so the state championship was our goal and we lost in the in the uh, uh finals we, we we got a lot of attention that year you know i was a top returning as a junior it was a preseason all-american and a, a mcdonald's high school all-american like i said i've had five or six teammates who played college basketball several of them division one another teammate who was a, on the bench who was a um played as a football at alabama so we had a lot of talent and ability uh but lufkin uh they weren't derifted talent they actually had two guys or two main players who were very good players in the old southwestern conference at smu and at baylor mm. and uh we just had a an ugly day i don't know we, we it was it just was a bad day we usually had a such a balance with all those those guys we were very good defensively but we'd have five different guys on any night might score you know 18 to 20 points or a little bit more you know one or two of them or sometimes three of them and and we just all had a down night so yeah it was a very disappointing loss but that's you know that's sports and and uh the Lufkin team was just a little bit more more ready I guess, and, and took advantage of that or, 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 or just performed better, I should say. Yeah, you're right. That, that is how sports work. And it's, it's just funny because, um, you know, you go after high school, you have your choice of some really fantastic schools here, you know, Duke, UCLA, Texas, Kentucky, BYU. Um, I got the feeling, Greg, and if I'm speaking for you incorrectly, please tell me, I, I feel like, yeah, it was about basketball. But I also feel with you was it was also about other things, right? I feel like BYU holds value to you outside of sports. Am I reading that correctly? And why you chose to go with BYU? Um, yes, I think that you know the the decision for me. You know, my parents let me make my own decision. That my dad had a couple of places uh, where he, he said he didn't want me to go just because he'd been mm. through his through his work on a couple of campuses back then. He said, ah, "I don't want you." there but uh they were really wide open with that choice although i think you know uh you know, the kind of they would have let me see me go to byu and they're very happy that i did but yeah you know all around not, not only you know looking for a great place athletically but and academically but socially spiritually and uh and so it was all those things i did have some connections out there my mom had um uh moved from canada when in um uh, to salt lake area when she was 10 her mom and her mom was from the greater Salt Lake area. And so I'd had some, uh, some, some, several relatives, including some of my aunts and my mom who had attended school there. And, uh, my, my siblings had, uh, some or all of their college there. So we had ties to it, but it was also, uh, to BYU, but the, all the other places were great opportunities too. And there wasn't like I couldn't have gone to those other places and lived my faith and, and done well. It wasn't like it was bad choices going to use you know, having to turn down UCLA or Kentucky <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> or Duke or University of Houston or something. And, and, uh, but, uh, you know, a couple of, couple of the, the, the things there, just a couple of things. I think the best decision though, overall about going to BYU, I had great experience in all those areas, academically, athletically, et cetera. But I met my wife, Jenny. Mm. She was on the women's team there. She was there a year ahead of me and she and her uh, roommate, well, she was, she told her roommate when she first saw me practicing, she was going to marry me. So I got recruited <laughs> twice, not only by uh, <laughs> the staff there at BYU, but uh, uh, by Jenny. And so it was a great, uh, great choice. We, we've had a, a wonderful marriage and, and a wonderful family. But you know, those years at BYU were great. Got to play there with Danny Ainge and Fred Roberts and two or three other guys who played in NBA or long careers overseas. So it was a it was a, it was a great basketball experience. Yeah, you stole my next question. I was going to say you eventually met your wife Jenny, and and, and yeah, yeah, you, you stole that. But yeah, I mean, it's definitely you definitely had a you guys had a great run in in eighty one. Um, you actually played that um the Hall of Fame game. I'm I'm about ten minutes from Springfield, so the Hall of Fame game you played that. And um, let, let me ask you. So you, you're coached by the legendary Frank Arnold, who was an assistant under under John Wooden. Um, great coach. What, what, what are your memories of him? Yeah, Coach Arnold was an excellent coach. He's he's still living out in the Salt Lake area, retired. We actually saw all of our some of our players saw all of our coaches now. Of course, they're getting up there in their eighties, approaching you know upper eighties and approaching nineties. But he was a he was an excellent coach. He was very um, um, uh, tell it like it is person. You know, he didn't he, he, he didn't uh, pull any punches when talking to anybody, but but a very good man. And we. Um, and uh trained as well conditioned as well um you know we were we were well um um schooled in the fundamentals defense 
And we run, you know, it came from the John Wooden era, um, then the, just uh, the end of the Bill Walton era. He was part of that uh, coaching staff with the 88 game winning streak at UCLA. So mm. our, our practices were, were run a lot like UCLA and I'm sure we ran, you know, some of their systems and things like that too. But, uh, uh, so it was a great experience. Coach Arnold was an excellent coach. I was happy that I had a chance to play for him. Yeah. Yeah. Great teams. And, you know, let me ask you, so how big is the adjustment period for you, Greg, right? When you jump, you played at a high level at high school, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's good quality basketball. Then you make the jump to division one college. Then you obviously make the jump to the NBA. Is there an adjustment period for each of those levels? Did it, did it take time for you to say, okay, all right, I'm, I'm high school now, I'm college. Was was there an adjustment period or is it just a matter of, you know what, I, I know the fundamentals, I know my game, I know how to work hard. What's that approach like for you, Greg? Yeah, there's an adjustment period uh, probably for everybody, Some more for, but going from one level to the next, absolutely, just because of the, uh, uh, one, you got that filtering process. You know, you go from, from uh, hundreds of thousands of a young men or young women playing, you know, uh, high school basketball or same age group overseas to, you know, 5,000 or whatever, 10,000 playing college basketball. And then, you know, only several thousand playing. So, so you're getting the best of the best. And then you get into college and you've got, you know, you're a freshman, you've got upperclassmen there who've, who've been there. So just being able to play. And it wasn't like, you know, even growing up in, in Houston and, in the off season and preseason, I, I would always try to go play with college players, pro players as much as I could always trying to find the best competition. But when you're playing against that level all the time, mm. it's, um, it's certainly a challenge. And there's some things, uh, you know, in the game, just like for a big guy where I grew fast and I was probably typically for the most part, offensively, you know, not too far from the basket, you know, learning and getting in the college game and you got more big guys getting a shot off and having, you know, a sound move to do that inside. And then certainly then once you got to pro level, then that's amped up another notch. You just got, you know, just such big, long players. And then I went to a team like the Celtics where we had, you know, three hall of, where I eventually over the time there played with five hall of famers on the, on the team. And, and uh, so it's an adjustment at every level. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's look at the NBA playoffs right now, you know, you're down to seven teams. It was eight here before Denver was eliminated. And there's very few, if any, rookies or even first, second year, I mean, even second year players who are who are starting. I can't think of one who's starting. And very few, if any, are even in the rotation. So experience at those at each level goes a long, long way, especially when you get into where you're getting to be more and more competitive in one of the top teams. Yeah, that's well said. And, you know, you're drafted 21st uh, by the Celtics in the 83 draft. Uh, we were approaching, unfortunately, uh, June 19th and 86 was the 35-year, uh, I guess, remembrance of the passing of Len Bias, which I still think is one of the worst tragedies in, uh, in never mind New England history, in, in Boston sports history. Um, you know, that summer, the Celtics trade for uh, for Rick Roby to Phoenix, uh, Dennis Johnson, number one pick. What's going through your head when you're drafted by the Celtics at that time, uh, Greg? Uh, well, I was, number one, just excited to be drafted and to be drafted in the first round after the uh, um and to be drafted by the celtics with their history and their tradition was 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 a thrill you know? and then and then danny Ainge, who was a good friend who i played with in college for two years was there so it was uh it was perfect and then and then to go there and be a part of those four and a half years that i was there four straight nba championship finals uh in an era where it was the uh peak years of the magic uh bird era, uh, era and uh kind of the, the 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 taking off the ramping up of the nba from a uh, tape delayed nba finals and <laughs> and uh, maybe more of a regional game to a national and worldwide game i was it was very fortunate to be part of that so being drafted by the celtics was very exciting absolutely yeah and and i almost feel like that you know and living in knowing like i could say this whether you're talking patriots or red Sox or bruins that 86 Celtics team is the most legendary team of any Boston sports team. Any, and you can make the argument. This is just how I feel. I feel like of any team of any sport in Boston history, I feel like that 86 Celtics team is the most legendary. I mean, people still talk about that team. People still talk about those players. Uh, that had to be just such a wonderful time in your life for you, Greg. Yeah, I'm very, very, very proud and often get mentioned and, Love the experience of being on all those teams in the 86 team. Like you said, 
even though we won in 84, uh, was probably the, the best of all those. And certainly I, I look at it as one of the best of all, all time, you know, with the addition of Bill Walton, who was relatively healthy that year. And I think we also picked up Jerry Seasing that year. We just really were, were, were clicking on all cylinders. You know, Bird, Bird and Paris McHale were all pretty healthy. So it was a, it was a great, great team. We had a great run. You know, we, we, you know, we always challenge ourselves not only to have the best record, but not to lose two games in a row. We only won, lost the one game to Portland at home, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and that was at the end of the year too, Greg, that was at the end of the year. It's like, uh, the, the Portland game was earlier. I think it was in December, but we did lose two games in a row at the end of the year, yeah, yeah. uh, in the regular season, but it was after everything was wrapped up and they're letting guys like me and, and, uh, and Rick Carlisle and Sam Vincent get a little more playing time. So <laughs> we didn't. And then we went through the playoffs with a strong run where it's uh, very few losses and, you know, playing the Rockets in the finals, but, uh, yeah, yeah, but, but it was, uh, it was great. And, you know, and, and just Bill coming in there, Bill was such a, you know, people forget about how good Bill Walton was as a player. Mm. And, uh, you know, there's it, a little bit of a parallel in those years. And Zandy Acre to like Arvidas Sabonis, when Sabonis came over here, he was, he was because of the injuries and surgeries and things like that. Sabonis wasn't anything like he was when he was in Europe, where he was probably the best player in the world mm. during his years in Europe. And then Bill, you know, of course, in his early NBA career and then coming out of UCLA was just dominant. So even with his, um, you know, his, his, his limitations because of his knees and his feet and things like that, he still was an incredible player. One of the best, uh, you know, you couldn't be any better than Bill Walden at timing and getting a rebound off the rim. And then just his leadership and his enthusiasm for the game. And you know, some of that pours over into what he does with announcing and kind of, uh, it's fun for me at least to listen to him and watch him. <laughs> I get a kick out of it, but, uh, he, he was, you know, we had winners on that, on the team before, but he's definitely a winner and definitely, you know, brought a, brought a great, uh, championship experience and vibe to the team that, that I think kind of put it all together. Yeah, plus, you know, plus it led to the day for Grateful Dead being at some of our practices, which was pretty <laughs> big. <laughs> so wait, so, so so the Grateful Dead were at a lot of the the, the Celtics practices. Uh, yeah, you know the Dead would go on those tours where they go, uh, like they come to Boston, they stay there for about a week because they play in thing in Worcester and Providence, you know, two or three shows or two or three nights, and so of course all the Deadheads travel with them. So that was during the basketball season, and. Uh, so most of our practices weren't at the garden. They were at Hellenic college or in Brookline, you know, a small yeah. gym. And we'd be there at 10, 30, 11 in the morning. And there's a band member. Uh, I can't remember that. Phil Lesh or I think Rusty Weir and Crutzman or one, one or two of these guys are, you know, in their town. And a lot of those days were at practice. And so we said to Bill, Hey, Bill, when's Jerry Garcia going to come to practice? He said, Bill said very seriously, he said, Jerry hasn't been to, hasn't seen daylight since 1968, <laughs> so, which is probably the truth. But, uh, but, uh, yeah, those, those guys came to the practices and then, uh, I didn't go, I didn't attend it, but a lot of the team went out to with Bill to a, uh, concert out at the Worcester Forum, uh, Worcester, um, whatever the center there, the arena was called, uh, to, to the dead concert out there and actually were backstage with the dead and they had, just during one of the numbers, they got some to get, uh, Invited the guys up on the stage, and they had Chief and Larry up there with a tambourine or maraca or something. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, and, and it, it, you bring up a great point. People talk about Bill Wall, and they, they they assume he's this zany Grateful Dead fan that used to play in the NBA. People don't know. I, I don't. I don't think many people, more people, should know how serious of a ga- student of the game this guy was, and how good he was. I mean, Bill Walton was the real deal. Oh yeah. Phenomenal passer, phenomenal defensive defensive player, rebounder, outlet. Um, uh, you know, a little Kevin McHale used to kid Bill with his offensive moves. He said, "Bill, you got these World War II moves. You need to get in the space age like me." But he was he was still a very he was a very very good offensive player. I mean, you just look back at you know it wasn't college, it wasn't the NBA, but NCAA championship game against Memphis when Bill's like what twenty one out of twenty two from the field. Wow, you know, and then uh, and then his years in Portland with those you know, great teams and a lot of uh, offense running through him, but but uh, he was a guy who could impact the game, and you know, and might not have been the leading scorer always, but 
you know, could certainly put up put up the points from center position, but just all facets of the game. Yeah, you know, passing, defense, rebounding, etc. Yeah, yeah. And, in, in, in watching a lot of the highlights, I was watching you and that and that team. I just I, I couldn't. I was watching one video after another after another. Um, the one video that wasn't well, it was kind of with basketball, but I had never seen this video. It's a commercial, and I stumbled upon it. I must have watched it fifty times in a row. It was the coolest thing I've ever I've ever seen. Do you remember making a commercial, Greg, for Scotch and Sirloin? It was uh, it was um, the whole team. Do you remember that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we did that every year. That yeah, that, it was it was a restaurant in North End, not far from the Garden. You could walk there, and and so in, in exchange for doing the uh, the commercial, uh, they, we could go up there and take take our guests and go eat <laughs> eat dinner. I, that was the exchange for doing the commercial. So. Most of the guys participated in it, and it was a lot of fun. Oh, I sent that to every Celtics fan I knew today, and, and none of them had seen it. A few remembered it, I was, and they were just taken back by it. I'm like, how great is this? And, and, and the other uh, highlight I saw of you, which I absolutely love, was Worthy was going in for a, a layup, and you you basically, I would call it a hard foul, you know, something today that would probably get you arrested because today's NBA is much different than the NBA you played. Yeah, it might be a flagrant two today. Yeah, but you know what, though? Well, and that's my question, I guess, here. It's like, I feel like that's what the Celtics and the NBA, I feel like, are lacking this year, right? So P.J. Tucker last week gets in Durant's face, and all of a sudden Durant's bodyguard is coming out on the car. I mean, it's like, are you kidding me? I feel like a lot of these guys, Greg, and I, and I said this question to Dino Raja when I spoke with him. I feel like a lot of these guys today would have a very difficult time in the 80s and the early 90s. Is there any truth to that, or am I being pretty hard on some of today's players? Uh, well, I think they would adjust and, you know, you know, what happened. I mean, two things happened to, um, the big things. And one was kind of a gradual thing was some of these hard fouls, uh, turned into, uh, guys just, instead of just fouling a guy hard, making him shoot free throws and maybe making them think about it. The next time they come into the basket was that, um, they turned into more just, uh, and this is even going back into the late eighties and or particularly in the nineties, um, just hard fouls where they, they were, you know, it was dangerous. They weren't just trying to, you know, sometimes you did, you know, make a hard foul, like the old make, make uh, McHale on Rambus clothesline where, mm. you know, I, I mean, Kevin wasn't trying to clothesline him. He was just trying to foul him from making that, that layup on the fast break, but there were just two guys going the opposite direction, you know, wrong speed. But, uh, but then the bigger change that, that's, that's really impacted today's game, where it's less physical, was but I think in 2004 or 2005, the NBA changed the, the defensive rules on hand checking at the ball handler, on uh, contact in the post, and uh, impeding the progress or what we used to call like bumping the cutters, you know, throwing them off their path on a cut into a spot. So, you know, you watch the NBA today, and and the reason they did that because store, scoring got stagnant. After the, towards the end of the Jordan era, and um, a lot of average and bad teams were slowing down the pace, trying to trying to give themselves a chance to win. And there was there were games in the seventies and eighties, so it wasn't real the best you know marketing and fan fan appeal. And some teams were averaging in the nineties, so the idea was to get the scoring up. Then you combine it with this explosion of, of three point shooting and spreading the floor. So yeah, right now you know you you go to the basket. There's some incredible ball handling. And not that these guys aren't talented and would be good in any era. And they're incredible at handling the ball and jukes and different kind of moves now, but you can't touch them or it's a foul. Mm. You know? Mm. And, and, and a guy, um, that had a, you know, it's a lot. And, and it's tough. Even, even now, if you go to the basket, you're going to get bumped and knocked around. So a lot of guys would just rather stand out there and shoot, shoot threes and not take the, uh, abuse and they've thrown all the analytics into the game. But uh, I think it, the pendulum's kind of swung a little bit too much the way. Yes, scoring's up, but if you go back and look at the, uh, go back and look at our scoring average of those Celtics teams we were talking about, we averaged over 100, 110 points a game. I think, I think in 286, we were like 111, 112. And we were maybe 10th in the league in scoring. But we had a lot of teams in, in the, in the upper, upper, uh, so, I mean, fans would be happy with that. If there's scoring, teams are scoring, uh, you know, 105, 110, 115 mm. um, a game. They're, they're, you know, it's an exciting, fast-paced game. But just the strategies have changed, and those two things have, have, have changed it. So I, I've read a little bit of something here. I think Dwayne Casey was mentioning, you know, maybe there needs to be a, a little step back, a little more physicality allowed in some, some areas to make it a little bit 
uh, more and more difficult. So, um, yeah, some of these guys, I mean, so, you know, Jordan or, you know, other top scorer in, in our era, uh, you know, or, uh, who was, um, George Gervin or whoever was the you know, leading scorers with these guys score, you know, and Adrian Dantley, those guys were scoring 30, 35 points a game with those rules back then they would score that or more than now and they'd be shooting someone would be shooting, you know, uh, a lot of three pointers. So, um, you know, the guys who are there are good scores now, you know, it'd be good scores in any year. They just with the different rules that adjust a little bit, but, um, I don't know. I don't know if they're ever, if, they're, if the NBA will ever consider that or go back to that. I mean, they're, they're making money The you know, most people dig, dig the threes and, and, uh, and, uh, that open, you know, getting to the basket, but it's certainly, uh, certainly changed uh, the, the the game and the way it's played uh, quite a bit. Yeah, it's just it's just I feel like the the Celtics Lakers rivalry. It's just there's nothing ever like it. I mean, the Celtics. I love watching them play, and it's it's a lot of fun. But I don't know. There's just something missing. I feel like in today's NBA, I love watching it. I think it's a great product. I think it's one of the funnest, the best sports out there. Uh, l- let me ask you before I get into the team a little bit. Uh, no air conditioning at the Boston Garden. Can you really feel that? I mean, when you played, was it like Jesus? It's. I mean, with all those people in there. Um, t- yeah, well, most of the year, you know, during the winter and and, and uh, early spring, it's not an issue. Right. When it got to be an issue was uh, in those. Uh, in those games, maybe in the, in the uh, conference finals or the finals where you get into May or June and you got a, you know, a warm, muggy streak in, in, in Boston. So it definitely was, yeah, it, uh, was, was hot <laughs> in the locker room and in the arena. And, um, but both teams are playing in the same condition. So, yeah. And, and yeah, I've heard you tell so. Yeah, and I've heard you tell so many wonderful stories about that team, you know. And, and I've heard you on another interview, and, and the guy quoted Bird. And, but but I read a different quote from Bird about you. You know, he said he took his frustrations out in a game the way he does at practice. He'd probably kill somebody. Um, I just get out of his way. <laughs> I get a feeling, I mean, as much as I loved watching those Celtics um, games in 86, that the practices were something to be watched. I bet you they were awesome. I mean, from from what I'm reading, those practices had to be pretty intense. They were we, mostly because we were very competitive, right? You know, right, right. we were um, some bodies flying around. I, I might have, might have, might have been just because that was me not being intentional, just being a bull in a china shop. But, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, we competed, and that was part of what made us good. We, you know, we, we, you know, and you get an NBA season, you got training camp for a couple of weeks where you got a lot, you know, fair amount of live scrimmaging as you get into the exhibition games but then you get into the regular season and you know you're playing anywhere from two to five games a week back in those days so there's only certain stretches where you even really go you know live you do a lot of half court stuff a lot of shooting but then you go live it may be short but and you got you know players like uh like the starters who are playing you know 30 30 to 35 minutes and they're just kind of recovering but we would go out there and push them and i think uh all the years and especially that 86 team and then you know, going in 87 with the same bunch, but we got a, you know, some injuries that slowed us down in 87. Um, that, that was, that was a really important part. It was fun. It was fun because the guys love to compete and we love to play and we would, you know, did the green team, you know, beat the white team. We'd keep scoring on the chalkboard and the of wins in the locker room and the white team would cheat. That's the starters, you know, and erase our wins. <laughs> but, but, uh, but it, it was fun, you know, so that's, and that's what makes, uh, I mean, you know, just like you said, the great rivalry for fans to watch, but even just playing a game, you know, it's, it's, uh, if you, you, you can get into it and you got some sort of competition going on, whether it's, you know, with yourself trying to beat your best time or record or whatever, or beating the opponent, you know, that's, that's what sports are all about. So. Yeah, it was it was great to have that. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and you had I want to say four four and a half seasons there. I want to say four trips to the finals, two championships. That's an unbelievable. I mean, you had a long career, which is hard to do in itself. But your resume alone with the Celtics, pretty impressive, Greg. Yeah, I mean, I was very fortunate, and uh, you know, they had a need. Obviously, if we traded Rick Rowe, we'd have another backup center. So, I, uh, right place, right time, and uh, you know, blessed to be there. And I and I didn't realize that. I knew the four in a row was, was great. And I remember a rookie year, um, Carlos Clark and Quinn Buckner, who were like 10 year veterans, you know, they're on the bench 
telling, I mean, not Carlos Clark, ML Carr and Quinn Buckard telling me and Carlos, who was the other rookie, he said, hey, Rooks, enjoy this. You don't get here, you know, to the finals, you know, every year. Those guys have been their whole career and hadn't been. So I get to go, you know, four years in a row and uh, really, really fortunate. And then, yeah, of course, in the rest of my career, I don't get to the finals, got to a, in the conference finals with the, my last year with the Pacers, but, uh, um, it, you know, it was awesome not to be, be, be a part of that. And, uh, and I never realized until it was mentioned when the heat did it with, uh, the, the, their big three with LeBron and Dwayne Wade and Bosch, where they went to the finals four years in a row that, uh, that was only when the heat did, it was only the third time in NBA history that, that a team had done that and the other two had been the Celtics, including our group. Mm. And of course, then the, now, since then, the Warriors did it five years in a row. But it's also interesting to think, you think of that four and five years, all of those teams, I don't know, uh, but ours with the Celtics, the Heat a bit, and then certainly with the Warriors, even though that bunch with the Warriors with Durant and Thompson and Curry were a little, little younger than like the Celtics, you kind of break down. And so they ended that, ended those runs. I mean, there's other things that come into play, free agency and whatnot, but we're uh, injuries, especially some of those key players. Mm. And that's what happened to us in 87. And, and, uh, you know, not that the Lakers weren't great and they would have may have won it anyway, but, you know, Kevin ended up getting a screw in his, uh, in his foot and a bone that was uh, a stress fracture after the season. Chief had injury problems. Larry, you know, Bill Walton wasn't healthy most of that year. And so it's hard to make that long run because you're playing, you know, basically you're playing when the, with the, when the schedule's on its normal pace from, you know, early October with exhibition season and training camp to mid June. And then you're doing that again for four years in a row. It's, you know, for those, those older bodies, the guys that have been around, the guys playing a lot. That's a lot of wear and tear and pounding and not a lot of recovery time in the off season. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and one of the, there's a couple guys I want to ask you about one of which I should have asked you about probably 10 minutes ago is uh, Danny Ainge. You know, he's been with you for a long time, right? BYU, your days with the Celtics, and I have to say, of late, the Boston media, the, the awful nastiness of sports radio, have been pretty bad to him, and I feel like fans have been unfair to him, too, because I feel like no guy has been more important to the Celtics over the last 30 or 40 years than Danny Ainge, whether it's a playing capacity, whether it's what he's done for the franchise. I feel like this guy is a smart guy. He's a good guy. He's given of himself. Um, I, I love Danny Ainge. He's one of my all-time favorite Celtics. What can you tell me about Danny Ainge from your perspective, and you guys still talk today? Uh, I love Danny too. Obviously, he's a close friend. He and his, his wife and his, or their family. Uh, you know, we've spent the years together in college, and then not only years with the Celtics, but then we were together one year with the Sacramento Kings, and we stay in touch uh, a bit. I haven't talked. I haven't had a chance to be in touch with him since he resigned. I know he's getting bombarded, and it's and it's sad to hear that he is. If he is getting blasted in the press and the media there, but you know what? I, if he is, it's it's uh, or by some of the fans. It doesn't bother Danny. Danny, one of, one of, one of Danny's favorite, my favorite lines of all time with Danny, uh, Danny said, you know, his, he was his coach in high school or something. He told him, he said, you know, if they boo you, which Danny used to get booed everywhere in all the opposing arenas when we played in college, he says, it just means that they know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have it. They're not booing the guy they don't know who you are. And, and there was a chance that, you know, I you heard Joel MB. You know, the other day, he's kind of like that. He said, you know, I love the chance to shut up this opposing, opposing crowd. So, um, uh, but yeah, certainly what he's done and been a part of the Celtics, I think, uh, you know, the, I think it was 18 years there. He was there as the, uh, uh, president of basketball operations and general managers. He helped to carry that on. And it just shows you how, I mean, we just talked about going four years in a row. You know, but and it was a different era, maybe with less teams, but how unique, mm. you know, it was in the early days of the NBA when the Celtics went all those years, you know, uh, those championships with Red and the Bill Russell era and th things like that. It's just so hard to get to the finals. He got to win a couple of finals and they won the one with, uh, um, you know, with uh, Garnett and Ray Allen and and Pierce and uh, and and then you you know then you make you make trades and you make moves and it's it's hard to maneuver too. I mean, it's hard to maneuver and, and have the the right pieces in place. And then even when you do, I mean, look at the Nets right now. Maybe they end up winning this series, but, you know, things happen and you get get injuries and, you know, so uh, it's, um, it, he did a great job. It's he awesome. I ought to be glad he was there and, you know, 
we all hope that the Celtics with Brad Stevens and other people in the future can get back to a championship or two. I mean, that's what it's all about, but it's, 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 it's difficult. You haven't seen, haven't seen the Lakers win many championships to get to the finals since the, you know, the Kobe Shaq era. So it's, right. it's a, uh, it's a challenge. Yeah, that, that, that's really well said. And, and, and you know, um, Ainge has left them with Jalen Brown, with Jason Tatum, with just wonderful nucleus and core. So I, 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 I love Danny Ainge, and I will always love Danny Ainge, and I hope he enjoys his retirement. I hope he comes back when, he's, when, he, when he wants to. Um, let me ask you this. So I've heard you tell tons of stories. I've heard, you know, there's a, there's a story. I don't know if I heard it from you or from somebody else where Casey Jones was drawing up a play and he's got Bird inbounding, but he's also got Bird on the wing. Like he's got Bird in two places at the same time. Um, what is one of your favorite, for those listening, one of your favorite stories or just little things that you remember from those wonderful Boston teams, especially maybe the 86 team? Yeah, that, that, that story about Casey with the, you know, <laughs> kind of absentmindedly putting Bird in two places. Wasn't, it, wasn't a bad decision to have Bird in two places. No. Like, it seemed like he was on the same play <laughs> at times. And, uh, and he might drop a play anyway, and Bird might just say, ah, not just throw his ball over here and I'll go, I'll go make the shot. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Casey, not, uh, you know, just, uh, not, not necessarily one specific story, but he was just a, he, he was a good person. I, he was a great person. I always said, uh, you know, if you couldn't get along with Casey Jones and don't want to play, uh, for him as a coach, you really couldn't get along with anybody. And he's just a wonderful person, good man. And, and, uh, and a competitor, you know, a competitor and intense, but, but, but very, uh, uh, quiet, dignified, professional. And, uh, and, uh, you know, one of the favorite things about him and just been excited out here was occasionally, you know, uh, we'd be on the road or maybe there was a function and, and Casey would get a chance to, chance, chance to sing. And I know there's a, probably on YouTube, you can find it. There's a video out there of him singing and he had an awesome, incredible voice. I mean, he could have been a, professional entertainer but he was uh he was he was he was very good i had a chance to uh um talk uh, recently a little bit to his son kip and i know they're uh putting together some uh some 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 memories and things are going to come out this year of uh different people with memories about him and and uh you know and and uh uh you know when he passed away just just kind of speaking to it with this we all and, and maybe other people had this experience, but I think, you know, coaches in our lives play such an important role, particularly somebody you've been around, you know, you're around for more than just a few months. I mean, not only at the youth level or the high school level or the college level, but even the pro level. You know, when he passed away, the first, um, I think I, yeah, I think I heard of his passing, but not long, long after that, I got a call from Rick Carlisle. You know, Rick's, Rick's in the middle of the NBA season. They were going to go play it. A game that day. I think it was Christmas Day too. And 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 then uh Rick and I and a couple other people got on the phone, Scott Webman and some others on the phone at the same time. I think we had a group of us who changed traded text mess text messages. And it was just of some of those memories and thoughts of, you know, K C and just, you know, the the sentiment there was just how much we all loved him and, and uh what a what a what a great uh not only coach but person he was. And uh so um yeah, that's that, that that it's just a wonderful, wonderful team. Um, after that, you end up going from the Celtics to the Clippers, who were probably on the opposite end of the spectrum at that point. Um, can you tell on a day to day basis it's a different culture, Greg? You know, as far as how you guys did things and you know, with, the, with those Celtics teams versus the Clipper days, not so much your work ethic because I think that's always been strong and sound. But the way the teams and the organization does things, and I'm not asking you to talk poorly about the Clippers, but w- w- was it noticeable difference the environment? Oh yeah, it's very different. Obviously, you know, winning uh, the environment and the players, you know, having the right players uh, and the coaching uh, are, are what puts you in the uh, in the place to win and be successful, with, like the Celtics. But you know, the Clippers were the opposite end of the spectrum. They didn't have that that history, but also you know, I would have to say that sometimes it didn't seem like the right hand knew, knew what the left hand was doing sometimes within the organization. But, um, uh, but certainly that they're not that there weren't talented players out there, but then it's just that, um, the atmosphere and, atti- atti- and attitude. So I went from the, you know, they had the, a, probably the worst record in the league at that time. For me, it was a big change, obviously, from being in the Celtics. It was a somewhat of a plus, though, from the personal standpoint, as far as being a, player in that here I was 
my fifth year in the league, and then I was in an opportunity in place where I had a chance to play significant minutes, you know, off the bench or as a starter for the next year and a half, and then even beyond that to to the uh, uh, Sacramento Kings for a year, and then later with the the Magic before uh, Shaq. But but anyway, that chance for any NBA player, young player, to go out there, you know, with, when, just like I mentioned earlier, when you're with a contending team, you're usually not in you know, a young player, especially somebody who's not going to end up being a all-star type player playing a lot of minutes when they're young. So you don't get a chance to make a lot of mistakes and go out there and kind of learn and grow. Whereas, so that was my good opportunity for me with the, the Clippers. I got to play a lot. And, uh, uh, but, it, uh, yeah, but you saw, you know, kind of permeated the organization or you might have a number of guys who would stick around after practice, you know, and, and with the Celtics and get some extra shooting or guys in the bench would play some two on two, three on three, whatever for conditioning and just for fun, you know, Guys on bad teams, kind of, most of them are out of the gym, you know, as quick as that, <laughs> that whip was gone. So just kind of the, you know, the, the attitude and atmosphere there. But, uh, but it sure was nice being living a, a few blocks from the beach in Manhattan Beach and being able to go to the beach in <laughs> February or, or March with her two young girls and her wife and, you know, play a little, play a little uh, beach volleyball with your teammate Joe Wolf and some others. And so yeah, 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 it, yeah. Was, it was fun, but it, but the season was over and, no, end of April, so it was a you know very different uh, set of circumstances there. Yeah, Greg, thank you for all this time. I have a few more quick questions for you. The first of which is, you mentioned the gym. Your work ethic is legendary for you know spending you know hours either before or after. You know, Bird was rumored, not rumored. He was you know at games three or four hours before they started running, conditioning, shooting. So yeah, that there's a lot to be said for that. Um, let me ask you this: so you've had experience with both these guys, and I've been dying to ask you this question all day. Um, I feel like a lot of people are divided on this, but if you had to choose one. Who are you taking, Shaq or Elijah Wan? Shaq or Elijah Wan? Well, if I had to choose one, um, hmm. it's a tough Good question because you go back, you go yeah. back and forth because uh, maybe well, Shaq during his Laker years, yeah, because he was, you know, Shaq was incredible. Yeah, uh, I mean, Shaq was. And not that Hakeem wasn't incredible. He's one of my favorite players of all time. You know, I, you know, I grew up in Houston, and Guy Lewis told me and three other All Stars in, in Houston he said, "Hey, if you come to, if you come here to University of Houston next year, we'll go to the Final Four. And what, what he didn't know was, I forgot to say, was because Hakeem Olajuwon is going to show up on my doorstep next summer. You know, <laughs> and we didn't know a lot about him, but, um, um, you know, geez, um. Yeah, in a lot of ways, I would take a team too. That's a that's not a fair question. I I, I like I like both those guys and yes. and uh, admired both those guys. But but Shaq, you know, as far as uh, our, our coach with the Ma- Magic was, uh, and we drafted Shaq was Matt Gukas, and Matt had played with Wilt Chamberlain with the Philadelphia Warriors when mm. Matt was a rookie and Wilt was like in his late twenties, and he said Shaq is the only person who could ever come close in all these years in NBA. Who was physically built like that and had so much power and speed and quickness. And so, um, as Shaq got a few years on him, particularly when he got towards the Lakers, you know, those years, he just had refined some of his game and, you know, hard to, hard to beat what he did and put up the numbers and combine with somebody like Kobe out there. It's, uh, kind of, you know, Elijah won, won a couple of championships. They were during the, you know, the years that Michael was playing, uh, baseball. Uh, so it would have been interesting to see the, you know, if the Bulls could have beaten the Rockets with Michael during those years. Yeah, yeah, it's well said. And one of the things I forgot to ask you quickly about those Celtics years was, you know, Bird legendary for that trash talk. And I'm sure many times you were you were within earshot of that. And, and you know, Jordan and I think Barkley, all those guys said you have, you know, people talk about trash talk. You know, Bird is the king and it's everyone else after that. I mean, was was Larry's trash talking that bad? wasn't that bad. It was that good. He was great at it. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin was really good at it too. But you know, the thing about that, you know, those guys, Kevin used to joke and say, well, I'm, I'm trying to steal the other guy's brain waves." And, and so it, it, you know, what, the, what they did as far as trash talking was, was, was gamesmanship. It was psychological warfare. It was having fun too, but, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like a braggadocio thing or, you know, I'm macho thing. I'm, you know, I'm better than you, that kind of thing. So, uh, I don't know if people always get that about trash talking. It, it was, you know, and in different ways and in, in different games. I mean, and certainly you could be out there as a player and be Kawhi Leonard and maybe, 
you know, never say anything, but you you can be pretty pretty intimidating. But you know, in baseball, they might throw close to your chin, and uh, and uh, uh, in golf, you might say, uh, "Bryce and I can outdrive you," or whatever they do. Deshambo and Quebec are doing now, you know, it gets a little spat, but, but, it, but, but the, you know, the, the, the head games that go on in team sports or even individual sports, you know, boxer or tennis, they're really important. So that's what that trash talk was about. Mm, mm. And, uh, and, but also too, you know, you get in a, you get in a, you get in a moment. And sometimes in the moment, I think that was part of what, uh, helped Larry be in the moment. You know, he just says, you know, he tell a guy who checked in the game, he said, Hey, you're, you know, your coach must not like you. Because <laughs> he's, got, he's got you guarding me, you know, or, or, or before he'd shoot a shot, he'd tell the guy who was bigger than him, he'd say, uh, too big, too slow. You know, he got smaller than him, too little, too late, you know. And, and uh, so, you know, just all kinds of stuff. It was part of, it was part of his confidence and his mindset. And also just to get the other guy to think about it a little bit, strategy. Yeah, and you know, I want to I want to end with one the last question being about your life because um, you know, you, twelve year NBA career, which is almost unheard of. You know, you phenomenal collegiate career, wonderful high school career. I mean, you just really put your time in. It's you know, if anybody wants a, an example of what effort and hard work get you through, I mean, you you are that guy. Um, but your charitable work, you work as a human being outside of this of sporting arena. Um, ho- you work with homeless kids. You have a huge family, ten kids, grandkids, great family guy. Um. How did how did um talk a little about that part of your life, Greg? Because I feel like it's it's a big part of your life. What you do, you know, you're still involved in basketball, I believe, in some way. But you're it's your charitable work and your other work. I think that you should be um, n- noted for as well. Well, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, you know, as far as the family goes, that's we don't consider that charitable work, but uh, just kind of the way our our you know uh, the Lord blessed our family was with, with ten kids. My wife. Who was college basketball player Jenny's five ten, and she told me she wanted a big family. I thought she meant uh, power forward centers, volleyball players, and supermodels, <laughs> and uh, she meant numbers. And uh, the way it worked out for us, where our kids were not biological, but we had adopted our kids all as infants, and uh, pretty much a miracle that we could uh, end up with ten. And uh, wow, actually, actually too short of what she used to tell people she was going to have a dozen kids when she. Uh, later when she's growing up so we've been blessed with that and then 25 years ago i mean and with our faith and just with our credentials we've always been you know people who've given and tried to serve others and uh but 25 years ago near the end of my career uh, uh with my wife's kind of inspiration motivation she wanted with a friend who was a teacher to help to start a private school and um and I kind of thought that the idea would blow over. And I said, we've got all these kids. What are you doing? Just inviting some other kids with them to homeschool or something. And uh, well, anyways, 25 years later, it's still going. Uh, it's called the Pathway School down in here in uh, Orlando. Those grades, K, pre, actually pre-K through 12th grade. And we have a nonprofit organization called the Gift of Learning Foundation that runs it. And the kids that we serve, yeah, some of them have been homeless, but we're really in an underserved, um, lower income, modest income a community, typically kids who wouldn't get to go to a private school. Mm. And, and there's been some programs in the state of Florida that have helped that. But, uh, so it's been good to see, you know, they've done a lot of good with being able to just help, uh, kids and people and families achieve, you know, not all the successes you always want, but a lot of great successes with people who've seen the kids achieve academically, uh, improve, uh, you know, and also, you know, learn some good things character wise and, and, go out in the world and be, be, be better people. And, and that's one of the ways I stay involved in basketball. A few years ago, we started a high school sports program and I help with the, um, now I've got it down to, instead of running the whole show, I'm just an assistant coach on the uh, <laughs> high school boys basketball team. So, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and I, and I should have separated those questions. I certainly wasn't implying that family is charitable. You're right. You're right. It was, it was two different. No, questions. It's, it's not. I just, you know, sometimes people say, Oh, you, you adopt your kids. What a, what, 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 you know, how, how kind you were to us. But it's, it's not like that. Those, those kids are our kids. We don't think of them any differently than, and they don't. They we're, you know, it's just that that's the way God brought them to us. And we were blessed to have those birth parents, to, you know, decide that they needed, uh, it's a better situation for them to adopt their children now. So yeah, you're you're a phenomenal human being. Uh, last question. Um, professionally, what you do now? Um, how much of what you did, um, in the NBA has prepared you or helped you with? You know, I mean. Obviously, not the athletic part of it, but the mental part of it to what you do today, Greg, professionally. 
Uh, when I get professionally, uh, little or zero in MPA, I'm actually have yeah, such a, you know, varied interests and things like that. I got into um, uh, the financial advisory business about 15 years ago. Actually, in Boston, I'd started to do a little internship with a friend who worked with Raymond James, but then I got traded out to the Clippers. But I got interested in business uh, and other aspects, actually real estate and real estate development. Uh, back when I was playing with the Magic and did some things here in Orlando and uh, still dabble in that with some real estate investment with a partner. But I'm, I'm with now with uh, what's called with Poly Wealth Management. We're an independent uh, uh, investment advisory firm. We do financial uh, planning for individuals and uh, we do um, uh, wealth management, money management uh, for them. And so um, just kind of recovering from uh, raising all those kids the grandkids are a lot cheaper so we're still working hard trying to you know, build up a little bit more money for retirement but i i enjoy that i enjoy doing that i enjoy helping people uh to uh kind of be their financial coach and i still get to do some basketball coaching too as well and stay involved in basketball so i get the best of both worlds as far as my uh occupation and avocation yeah, it is you know you were a a great player, and I loved I loved your career all all on out. But I have to say, you're even a better human being, man. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast and giving me all this time. I appreciate it so much, Greg. You're very welcome, Derek. Thank you very much, and, and good luck to you with your podcast. Please place this team in historical perspective. How good is this Celtic team in comparison with the other champions? I think it's one of the greatest, if not the greatest team. I've ever been associated with, especially over a long season. They just produced every time they had to. They were a great bunch of guys. The chemistry was great. I'm very happy, very happy for them. It's the Boston Celtics, well, maybe one of the greatest, if not greatest, passing teams of all time. Field by Ainge, ahead to Bird, to the trailer Ainge, to Bird. They made it look easy. Boston tradition, a nice fast break. You keep that defensive man guessing, and it's easy to get the hoop. Celtics running. They have a chance here. Four on two. Bird to Paris. Just marvel at the way these Boston Celtics play basketball. We look at him move the ball. Look at him move the ball. With the Celtics, it doesn't matter who has the ball. If somebody else is open, they're going to get it. Isn't that beautiful? That's just beautiful basketball. Look at that pass by Bill Walton. You guys look for passes that other teams don't look for. You thread needles, and the guy's looking for the needle to be thread. Yeah. On this team, if you move to get open, you're going to get the ball. You know, here the goal is winning, and it doesn't matter who scores the points or who gets the shots, you just win the game.
Celtic basketball.